So welcome to lesson one, um, our connection to the land, the Jewish claim to the land of Israel. Um, and the goal of this lesson is to, to try to figure out what is the role that the land of Israel plays in the, in the Jewish consciousness and in Jewish life. Um, why is it even important for Jews to have a land, to have a homeland? Why do we need that? And then, of course, what claim do we have to the land of Israel? Um, and I'd like to open with a brief excerpt from the book of Daniel. Um, Heidi, if I can ask you to get us started by reading for us text one. Uh, let me just set up the clip for the, 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 the quote that she's going to be quoting. This is from the book of Daniel, and it's about the prophet Daniel. So Daniel was uh, a man who lived, everybody familiar with the story of Daniel? Daniel in the, come on, at, at least we've watched Fiddler on the Roof. Lion's Den. Very good. At least, if we, even if you've watched Fiddler on the Roof, you know Daniel Lion's in the Den. Lion's Den, right? Right. So Daniel was a prophet. He was a leader of the Jewish people at the time. So this is about 50 years after the destruction of the Second Temple, which we commemorated yesterday. And we fasted, right, Tisha B'Av. Um, and he was also a high-ranking minister in the, in the court of, uh, of Emperor Darius the Mede. Darius, when he was known as Daryavish, was the son of Korish. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce that one in, in Hebrew, in, 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 uh, in English. Um, who was the one actually who allowed for the second temple to be rebuilt. I'm sorry, not his son, his great-great-grandson. Um, and because this is 400 years later, 450 years later at this point. Um, and as would be whenever there's a high-ranking Jewish officer, so the other officers were jealous, and they told Darius that uh, his allegiances do not really lie with you, they really lie with Israel. They really lie with, uh, with um, uh, you know, the Jewish people and the land of Israel and that sort of thing. They said, and if you'd like to know, to, if you'd like to see the truth of that, you will see that if you come to his house, you'll find him praying, and you'll find him praying towards Israel. And text one picks up right there. Go ahead, Heidi, I, I, when you're ready. Okay, where am I reading? So we are on page two of our book, text one. <laughs> what page are we on? Here you go. <laughs> um, okay, uh, upon, oh, sorry, yeah. Upon learning that the decree had been written, Daniel went to his home, where in the upstairs room, there were windows open facing Jerusalem. Three times a day, he kneeled and prayed and gave thanks to his God, just as he had done beforehand. These events, let me just remind you, transpired about 2,400 years ago, 50 years after, after the destruction of the first holy temple in Jerusalem. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I made a mistake. I was saying the second holy temple. I meant the first holy temple. I, I had said that earlier. Um, and so the Jewish people are now living in Babylon, all right? And yet Daniel is doing exactly the same thing that we do every single time we pray. Here in California, we pray towards the east, right? And he prayed towards whichever direction it would have been, I guess, north something, right? <laughs> um, from Babylon towards Israel, towards, towards Jerusalem. Um, and in fact, not only is this part of our uh, consciousness when we pray, but even in our actual prayers, Joanne, can I ask you to read for us text two? Very, very often we evoke Jerusalem and we even pray to be returned to Jerusalem. Okay, can you hear me? We do. Okay, sound the great shofar for our freedom. Raise a banner to gather our exiles and gather us from the four corners of the earth into our land. Blessed are you who gathers the dispersed of his people Israel. So not only do we pray towards Israel, but we pray to be returned to Israel at some point. This is only one example of many times in, in our prayers that we pray, pray about Israel. I'm just trying to set the tone for why Israel, where, where we see that Israel is so important here. Um, and we find this all over our prayers. Um, so much so that even when we, um, when we eat or, or when we conclude eating, many of you have been to my house for Shabbat dinner or you've been to other rabbis' houses for Shabbat dinner, we always conclude, con conclude with Birkat Amazon, the grace after meals, right? Right before we start the grace after meals, Larry, if you can read for us, text 3A is a, oh, you don't have a book. Hold on. He, he just texted me, he doesn't have a book. You can drop by whenever yeah. you like to pick up the book. Okay, uh, about 445. Thanks. That's fine. Um, and, and you have the PDF in your email if you'd like to try to pull that up. Oh, you have right, thank you. The PDF. Uh, then call on me next time. Let me see if I can find it. Right. Sounds good. Okay. While do you want, you want to try to, do you, have, do you have the PDF with you? Okay, so then Lon. If you can, please, text 3A from Psalms, a psalm that we say immediately before the grace after meals. By the rivers of Babylon, we sat and wept as we remembered Zion. We hung our harps on willows in its mist. For there our captors asked us, 
asked of us to sing songs, our tormentor, tormentors insisted on joyful tunes. Sing for us with the songs of Zion, they demanded. How can we sing the song of God on foreign soil? If I forgot you, O Jerusalem, may my right hand forget its skill. May my tongue cleave to my palate if I do not remember you. If I do not recall Jerusalem at the height of my joy. So every single time we eat bread, and that's what you say the race of the meals, we start off by mourning, literally mourning. And here's, there's some very famous lines here, right? Anybody ever hear? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, right? There's some very famous songs with those, with those words. Um, and, and we mourn for, Jer for Jerusalem. Now, even on Shabbat and holidays, when we're not supposed to mourn, and we're not supposed to be sad. So we substitute this psalm. And Lon, if you could keep reading the rest of the threes. So text 3b is the substitution that we do when it's Shabbat and holidays. We substitute the mournful tone for a joyous tone, but still speaking about the Holy Land. A song of ascents. When God returns to the returnees of Zion, we will have been like dreamers. Our mouths will then be filled with laughter and our tongues with song. They will then say among the nations, God has done amazing things for this nation. Okay, and then when we actually get into the middle of the grace after meals, we're, we're not done yet. When we get into the center of it, we again pray for Jerusalem. Go ahead. Our God, have compassion on your people Israel, on your city Jerusalem, on Zion, the dwelling place of your glory, on the kingship of the house of David, your anointed one, and on the great and holy house upon which your name is called. Rebuild Jerusalem, the holy city, city speedily in our days. So lest you think that uh, Jews caring about Israel started with the JNF or started with the, or even started with the founding of the state of Israel or started with Zionism even before that. This is, we're talking 2,400 years ago. We're talking certainly since the destruction of the temple, but even before that, that Jews have always yearned for Yerushalayim, for, for, the, for the land of Israel, et cetera. Um, actually, as often as possible, Jews, and, and obviously depending who, Jews have actually chosen to this is a slide that I skipped that I was supposed to show about the, 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 um, the, the goals of, of, of this lesson. Um, but even not just in our prayers, but throughout history in our uh, rituals, we find uh, Israel represented very, very often. Of course, at, at every single Jewish wedding, the most exciting moment when everybody knows the solemn part of the wedding is over and the good food is coming <laughs> is when they break the glass and uh, everybody says mazel tov, right? But why do we break a glass? Because even at our most joyous moments, we want to remember the destruction of Jerusalem um, when we mourn. So that was at our happiest moments, but also at our saddest moments. When we mourn, if you walk into any shiva house, what is the customary greeting, the customary consolation that we give to, uh, to, to, to the person who, who, who we are who we are you know, consoling in their grief, may God console you, among all the other mourners of Zion and Jerusalem. Again, we mention the Holy Land at, on our holidays, Passover, Yom Kippur, we always say next year in Jerusalem, right? So no matter the, the occasion, we are always mentioning the Holy Land. Um, as often as possible throughout history, Jews have also taken this into action. Um, there have been many notable aliyahs, um, you can see on page six, there's an amazing graph of them to see how often, and, and sometimes they were, you know, uh, uh, connected with uh, anti-Jewish prejudice and uh, uh, violence throughout history, but there, was, oh, there, there were aliyahs that, that, that were going towards Israel. This started before the founding of the state of Israel in 1915, in 1932, in 1949. This is already after the founding of the state. Um, in, uh, uh, of course, Russian Jewry coming, uh, beginning with Georgia and then later on, and not only in their lifetimes, but actually even in their death, there are many people that we that, that we know of, whether laymen, who obviously I, I, I can't bring any examples of that. I mean, I, I know people, but not people that you would be familiar with, who in their death said, I, even though I never lived in the land of Israel, I would like to be buried there. In fact, many people have a custom um, meaning the, 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 the prevalent Jewish custom is to take a little bag of dirt from the land of Israel and pour it into our gravesite. Into when, when a loved one passes away, we pour it into the gravesite in order that that person should be connected with the land of Israel. Um, Maimonides is one famous person. He lived in Egypt and was buried in Israel. Right after he passed away, he asked to be buried in the land of Israel. He's buried, of course, in Tiberia, in Tiberias. Um, another example, and this will lead us into text four, um, is Rabbi Yehuda Halevi. Uh, you can read a little bit more about him. Um, hold on a second. No, I want to do this one at a time. So this is Maimonides. 
And I'd love to quote Maimonides in text four. Uh, Larry, did you did you get the text? Yes. Okay. So if you can read for us, please, text four on page eight. This is actually a quote many of you will be familiar with because I shipped many of you a bag of dirt from the Holy Land. And I quoted this quote. Go ahead. Okay. The great sages would kiss the boundaries of the land of Israel upon arrival, kiss its stones and roll in its dust. Indeed, it is written in Psalms 102.15, your servants cherish her stones and favor her dust. Although one cannot compare being received by the Holy Land during one's lifetime to being received by it after one's death, nevertheless, the greatest sages would bring their dead to be buried in the Holy Land, as can be learned from the example of our father Jacob and the righteous Joseph. Talk about practicing what you preach. Maimonides himself, as we saw, is buried in Tiberias. Um, but another famous sage who is buried in Israel is a man by the name of Rabbi Yehuda Halevi. And there's a very, there's a fascinating, uh, uh, he, he lived in Spain and immigrated and, buried, and was buried in Israel. And there's a fascinating story, which we're not sure if it's myth or fact, um, in other words, fact or fiction. But first, let's see his yearning for the land of Israel, and then I'll tell you that story. Text five. Uh, who are we holding here? Adrian, can you read for us, please? Do you have the text open in front of you? I don't know if she is there. So Heidi, we'll come back to you. Uh, text five, when you're ready, on page nine. My heart is in the east, and I am at the ends of the west. How can I taste what I eat, and how could it be savored? How shall I render my vows and my bonds while Zion is yet in the fetters of Rome and I am in the shackles of Arabia? It shall be as easy for me to forsake all the bounty of Spain as it is precious for me to behold the dust of the desolate abode. So if you're not familiar with Rabbi Yehuda Halevi, this might, may come as a shock to you. This is obviously a poem. Um, if, if you're reading this in Hebrew, then you can see that it's written in a very poetic form. Rabbi Yehuda Halevi was a great Jewish poet and a philosopher. <laughs> I don't know that those two often go together. You know, it's like the artistic and the intellectual. But I'm trying to. One of the most famous, welcome Howard and Judy. Good to have you guys with us. Um, I muted you because we were hearing some background noise. So when you're ready, you can feel free to unmute yourself. Um, there is a, a, an amazing Jewish philosophical work, which is actually written as, as a conversation between the king of the Khazars and um, a rabbi, which is written by Rabbi Yehuda Halevi. And many people say that it's actually fictional, but it's just a, a kind of a, a, a rhetoric, like a, a form of, of, of a, a literary form of how to, how to write his thoughts. But they talk about a lot of Jewish philosophy and it's written as, as, if it, as if it's an argument or a conversation between the king of the Khazars and Yehuda Halevi, and eventually he converts to, uh, the, the king converts to Judaism as does his, his entire nation. Um, that book is called the Kuzari, and it's an amazing philosophical work, but we're quoting here from Rabbi Yehuda Halevi's other lesser known work, which is called Shiri Rabbi Yehuda Halevi, or the songs and poems of Rabbi Yehuda Halevi. And this is obviously one of his that yearns for the city of Jerusalem. The story that I was talking about earlier is that they say that Rabbi Yehuda Halevi, again, we're not sure whether this story is, is, is factually accurate or not, but it definitely fits with his yearning for Jerusalem, that uh, Rabbi Yehuda Alevi eventually did immigrate to the land of Israel. And when he came to Jerusalem, he tore his, his, uh, his garments in mourning for uh, uh, the city of Jerusalem. And as he was walking along, along, along the, kind of like crawling along the earth and quoting that same verse, which Maimonides had quoted, Hiratsu which means that the, we, we want your, your dust and we, and, and we roll in, in, in the earth of, of, uh, of, of Israel, as he was saying that, there was a Yishmaeli, an Ishmaelite, an Arab of some sort who saw him, became very jealous of his great desire for the land, and trampled him with his horse, and that's how he died. So whether that story is true or not, certainly it, it fits in with a general attitude that Rabbi Yudha Levi seems to have had for the land of Israel. This exercise can get very, very exhaustive, which is why you may have noticed I've been moving very quickly through it. I think we're all familiar, familiar with how great and how, how, um, how prevalent Israel is in Jewish culture. Um, but th this is just a sampling to try to understand um, you know, the importance that the land of Israel plays in our, in our religion, in our culture, in our nation. That being said, um, let's now turn to the Six Day War. So, um, the British, um, this is just a brief history of Israel. I don't think anybody here needs this, but just in case, the British who ruled the Holy Land from 1917 to 1948, um, 
had severely restricted Jewish immigration to the land of Israel. Um, and during the 1930s and 1940s, of course, during the Holocaust, um, this ended up being a tremendous, tremendous part of why there weren't thousands and thousands of Jews who immigrated to Israel. Um, eventually, and, and, and that's a result of a particular white paper, we'll talk a little bit more about the white paper soon, um, which limited Jewish immigration to the land of Israel. Um, once the state was established, uh, for the first time in 19 centuries, hundreds and thousands of Jews arrived from every corner of the world. One of the first orders of business of, of the state of Israel, in fact, I think it's even in the, um, uh, the Declaration of Independence, was to rip up the white paper and say that, that it, no, it no, longer, no, no longer applies. Of course, we know that there was immediately a war, the War of Independence, um, and Israel was established. After Israel managed to make it through the War of Independence, um, the Arab nations swore that they would destroy Israel once and for all. M once and for all. Um, by 1967, there were some 2.4 million Jews living in Israel. And now I will let the video take over. Oh, hold on, hold on. Let me just, uh, how do I have this? Let me share this again, I think. To make sure that the audio comes through. There we go, that should be better. The six days of warfare in 1967 between Israel and its Arab neighbors are legendary for the staggering speed and fury of Israel's military victory. But the dreadful days of rage and trepidation leading to the outbreak of hostilities were no less dramatic. The Arab nations refused to accept Israel's presence. To the Arab mind, the humiliation of their defeat in 1948 could be removed only by soaking the Holy Land in the blood of its Jewish inhabitants. In the months before June 1967, calls for Israel's annihilation swelled into a hysterical battle cry on the streets of every Arab country in the Middle East. Egyptian President Gamal Abdel Nasser stood at the heart of this incitement. A charismatic leader with appeal across the Arab world, Nasser campaigned for Arab unity and for the military destruction of Israel. His blood-curdling speeches were broadcast to every Arab nation, inflaming populations and shaping anti-Israel policy. Israel was a precarious sliver of land along the Mediterranean sand, barely 12 miles wide at her waist, and dwarfed by colossal foes in every direction. Egypt growled to her south, Jordan menaced her eastern border, and Syria rained mortars onto her north. These three nations commanded formidable standing armies and boasted hundreds of modern tanks, aircrafts, and artillery units. Additional Arab countries were prepared to offer varying degrees of commitment to any war against Israel, ranging from symbolic support to actual pilots, planes, tanks, and troops. Foremost among these were Iraq, Saudi Arabia, Algeria, Kuwait, and Lebanon. Behind these loomed a larger foe, the Soviet Union, which armed and advised many of the Arab governments. Israel leaned on the support of a heavyweight but half-hearted ally, the United States of America. But President Lyndon B. Johnson, who took office in 1963, mired as he was in the Vietnam War, was more concerned with de-escalating the Cold War than addressing Israel's existential concerns. It was the Soviets who extended a lit match to the Arab powder keg that erupted in the 1967 Six-Day War. On May 13, 1967, the Soviets supplied Egypt with false intelligence, claiming that Israel has mobilized to invade Syria. They urge Egypt to take action, and in the first act of aggression, Nasser rolls his enormous Egyptian army into the Sinai Peninsula towards Israel's southern border. The Arab world erupts in euphoric celebrations and calls to slaughter the Jews. 
Nasser becomes an instant hero. Israel and the UN publicly clarify that Israel has not mobilized against Syria. But Nasser responds on May 15th by ordering the UN peacekeeping force that forms a buffer between Egypt and Israel to withdraw from Sinai. Israel's government is thrown into panic. UN Secretary General U Thont unilaterally orders his peacekeepers to comply with Nasser's demand. On May 19th, to Israel's horror and to the world's astonishment, the UN emergency force vanishes, leaving Israel exposed to a vast Egyptian force that would swell in just three days to some 80,000 troops and 600 tanks. Israel orders a large-scale mobilization of its army reserves and issues a stern warning that should Egypt close the Straits of Tehran to Israeli shipping, Israel will consider it an act of war and react accordingly. Meanwhile, the Arab world escalates its rhetoric. On May 18th, Cairo Radio broadcasts the following message. Every one of the 100 million Arabs has been living for the past 19 years on one hope to live to see the day Israel is liquidated. There is no life, no peace, nor hope for the gangs of Zionism to remain in the occupied land. As of today, there no longer exists the UN International Emergency Force to protect Israel. The sole method we shall apply against Israel is a total war, which will result in the extermination of Zionist existence. On May 20th, Syria's Defense Minister, Hafez Assad, declares, our forces are now entirely ready, not only to repulse any aggression, but to initiate the act ourselves and to explode the Zionist presence in the Arab homeland of Palestine. The Syrian army, with its finger on the trigger, is united. I believe that the time has come to begin a battle of annihilation. And then it happened. On May 23rd, Egypt blockaded the Straits of Tehran to Israeli shipping in an act of war under international law. Israel's oil supply route is now cut off. No nation has rallied to Israel's cause. Mayor Amit, head of the Israeli Mossad, later recalled the tense days before the outbreak of the war. In the middle of the night, I received a visit from the CIA representative in Israel who said to me, if you shoot first, you will stand alone in this battle. Israel's military, intelligence, and civil leadership anticipate the worst. With Israeli men drafted into the army, the economy falters. Life grinds to a standstill. Students, housewives, and children dig trenches, build shelters, and volunteer for essential services. Anticipating record loss of life, Israel designates parks as mass cemeteries. A spirit of despair settles over the country's two million Jews who whisper with dread of a second Holocaust. But Nasser is upbeat. He is ready for war. On May 26th, Nasser addresses the General Council of the International Confederation of Arab Trade Unions. We are ready to enter a general war with Israel. The battle will be a general one, and our basic objective will be to destroy Israel. On May 30th, King Hussein of Jordan signs a defense treaty with Egypt, placing the Jordanian army under Egyptian command. The Egyptian-Syrian-Jordanian axis is now complete. Ahmed Shukeri, chairman of the PLO in Jordanian Jerusalem, is asked in a June 1st news interview what will happen to the Israelis if there is a war. His response? Those who survive will remain in Palestine. I estimate that none of them will survive. The Arab military buildup continues. Egypt has 100,000 troops and 930 tanks in the Sinai, and another 110,000 soldiers and 450 combat aircraft on notice. Syria has 63,000 troops, and Jordan, 55,000. Israel's mostly civilian army is absurdly outnumbered in manpower, weaponry, planes, tanks, and artillery. Slightly more than two decades after the Holocaust, and less than 20 years since the United Nations resolution that authorized the Jewish people to create a state in their ancient homeland, the world had turned its back on the Jewish state 
and its population of survivors. There is no response to the Arab claim that the Jewish people are interlopers in their own land and have no right to the biblical land of Israel. Okay, um, as I mentioned, we, we, uh, we are doing a course where we're gonna use the Six Day War as a springboard to discuss different topics. And the topic under discussion now, or the moment in the Six Day War, which we're discussing now is the lead up to the Six Day War. Every single Arab nation around the world screaming death to Israel. The, the, the Jews have no right to exist. The Jews have no right to, to live in Palestine. It belongs to um, the Arabs. It certainly doesn't belong to the Jews and we want them out. We want them annihilated. We don't want a single one of them alive. Um, a lot has changed since 1967. It's important to start with that. Um, starters, and I think we have some of them here in the slide. For starters, in 1967, um, there were about 2.4 million Jews, as I mentioned. Uh, today, uh, there are about 7 million Jews that live in the land of Israel, uh, amongst the population of about 9 million. Um, Certainly, it has to be said that the, the military in 1967 was considered very, you know, ad hoc and, and a nation that had just started a, a number of years ago, and they were still trying to figure out what a military even means, never mind intelligence and stuff like that. Uh, it's definitely become a lot more sophisticated today, um, not just the Iron Dome, which is, which is depicted, but, but lots of armies around the world come to Israel even to learn from Israel's, Israel's military. Um, the economy um, and technology, if you've read Startup Nation, you're, you're definitely familiar with this that Israel's economy is so much more robust. In the video, one of the things that they mentioned was um, that the, Israel's economy was shot because everyone needed to go to war. Um, I, I, I don't know that, that obviously a war would still take a toll on, on Israel's economy and it still does every single time there is any sort of friction, um, but definitely it's a much more robust economy. Um, and then of course, there is the fact that multiple attempts have been made at peace treaties and some of them even successful with Israel. Uh, Right? Not many of them successful, but some of them successful. But what I'd like to talk about is the underlying uh, uh, impetus for the Six Day War. Uh, and that in, in, with regards to that, I think we can say that the more things change, the more they stay the same, particularly in two aspects. Um, in 1967, uh, all of these Arab countries gathered together with one sole purpose, which was to annihilate the Jewish people. Uh, to annihilate Israel and to, to, to get them out of that land once and for all. And uh, as they were quoting from, from uh, I forgot exactly which Arab leader it was in, in, in Jordania and Jerusalem, where he said, I estimate that none, none of them will survive. Um, that threat to existence, even if we might be able to defend ourselves a little more, but that, that attitude uh, still exists. Um, it, 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 we could point to some more obvious things like uh, the Iranian nuclear threat or, or Hamas, who, who just a month ago, even though the news cycle now goes so quickly that it feels like it was three years ago, it was only a month and a half ago that Hamas was firing rockets down on, on, on civilian uh, Israeli towns. Um, we have, and that's from Gaza. We also have Hezbollah in, uh, in you know, you know, with uh, with all of their uh, business that's coming out of Lebanon and ISIS on on, on the borders um, of Syria and the Sinai. Um, but really, even if you talk about less. Um, obvious threats, th threats to to, uh, to to Israel and to the Jews. There's kind of this general attitude among the world. Um, we're just like in 1967. Um, no country came to our rescue. Even even, even America said, "Don't you dare shoot first. Um, but a another one of the threats. So, so, so the threat to the existence, but also the hostile world opinion is also a big thing to take into account. Just like in 1967, there was nobody there with us. Uh, today, I think a very similar thing could be said. Every time, in fact, it may, it may have even, even gotten worse. Uh, every time there's anything going on in Israel, social media is full, and that's just anecdotal evidence. Social media is full of anti-Israel sentiment. But even, even if you start to talk about governments and how many of them will, will, talk to, will tell Israel that it needs to stand down and just allow Hamas to keep firing rockets and, and, and killing, you know, killing innocent Jewish civilians, it's startling. Uh, the BDS movement, of course, as pictured, is another uh, indicator of that. So I think that two of the things that we can safely say haven't changed is that there are very clear threats to Israel and to the Jewish people. 
and that there's a hostile world opinion in general to the Jewish claim to the land of Israel and certainly to the way that the, to the, way the land of Israel is today. Um, let me stop for a moment to, for you guys. Uh, what else do you think is different or the same about those moments in 1967 and the way things are today? Anybody want to chime in here, either in the chat or, or you can unmute yourself? Well, I would say you're saying that in 67, Israel armed its own self. It had no outside support whatsoever with all their military equipment and all that. Is that what you're What's the question? If the U.S. supplied anything, the U.S. had been supplying before that, uh, but the U.S. made it clear that if the Jewish people go in to defend themselves when they start, then they will not have any support from, from the U.S. Wait, wait, I want to back up. Yeah. If Israel uh, were to defend itself or act offensively by like a preemptive attack, what, what, what was the position? And again, I'm going back to and I'm not, I don't want to get philosophical. I'm just wondering, did um, <laughs> we're supposed to get philosophical? It, in other words, Israel was standing entirely alone and built its 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 own military from scratch. It had no other countries supporting no, it. it. Had assistance a little bit in building a military. That's true. Okay. But at the time of the Six Day War, it stood alone. Okay, so then the other part of it is, uh, was the U.S. opposed to Israel's defensive moves or to its offensive moves? In other words, was Israel, because they didn't want to say, okay, Israel act preemptively to go after these people. I, I think we saw that clearly in the video, no? The CIA operative made it, the CIA agent made it very, very clear to uh, Mayor Amit that if, if you start, you, you will stand alone. Your question is whether that was offensive or defensive. I think at that point, any move, even if they were offensive, was defensive. Oh, huh, okay. Uh, Joanne, go ahead. Any differences between 1967 and where we stand today? Well, I think one of the other things in 1967, uh, at the, certainly at the beginning of the... Um, no, nope, I take that back because I'm thinking about 1947, so just forget it. <laughs> okay. okay. Even in 1947, I think the U.S. Um, made it illegal to transfer arms to Israel, and there were Americans... Um, uh, servicemen who were had gotten out of the army who um, uh, wanted to go to Israel to help fight, and that they also had to do that uh, illegally. Right. Yes. Yes. So, that, that was twenty was years before. Change. Yeah, a lot changed in those twenty years. Yeah. So, so I'm, I'm right now on this this word. Lon, go ahead. I want to talk about the threat to Israel's existence. I think one of the biggest things that makes me nuts is Israel's inability to market to the, the world population we are. Threat to their existence from the beginning. And it's like, I know lots of people, young people in universities and all, and they're all supporting Palestinians and you know Israel's doing everything wrong. Now Israel does do a lot of stuff wrong, I get it. <laughs> but, the, but the basic concept that people don't realize is these enemies of theirs have been trying to destroy them since 1947, right? But and, what and I think that Israel and its everything about it, they don't do a good job getting this message out. But I think that would be another be, aspect where where Israel is where it stands in the same position that it, as it did in 1967. Oh yes, exactly. Still, still not learning from that mistake. Okay, but but I I would argue, of course, I'm not, I'm not defending Israel here. Of course, Israel can do a better job in, in PR, and that has a lot to do with the Israeli mentality, maybe that they don't really. They're not very into PR, but I think it, it can also be argued the other way. If we put the onus on, on the nations of the world, right? I mean, we do that with every other country when it comes to Israel, nobody bothers to take a look and see who's trying to kill the Jews and how serious we should take this or how serious we shouldn't. I mean, there's no question. Bibi Netanyahu got up in front, in front of the UN and spoke about Iran and, and, and how important it is to stop them from, from gaining nuclear arms, et cetera. And for the most part, the world just left, right? So. So there definitely are, I'm, I'm not putting the entire onus on, on the nations of the world, but definitely part of it is whatever Israel does tell the world, for the most part, Israel's not believed. And, 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 and Israel stands alone. But it also gets back to the idea of you say something enough, people will finally maybe hear you. And that happens on all sides of arguments. Yeah, yeah. I just don't think that uh, people that are in support of Israel, not just <clears throat> Israel, but Americans that are in support of Israel are not getting the message 
of uh, destroying, uh, the, you know, the destruction of Israel being the goal of their neighbors and of these other countries. That's all I have to say. Okay. So what I'd like to do is to take a moment to, not a moment, to take the, the you know, 50 odd minutes that we have left to the class or 40 odd minutes that we have left to the class to um, address this particular aspect, okay? Which is Israel's right, Israel's claim to the land of Israel. Um, in your books, we're on page 10. And what we're going to do now over the next about half an hour, and then we'll conclude the lesson with, with a very powerful takeaway, um, is we're going to talk about our claim to the land of Israel. And we're going to take a three-pronged approach. Number one, we're going to talk about the historical claim that the Jewish people have to the land of Israel. Again, answering the Arabs, even though they're not in the room with us now, but that we should, we should know the answer and we should be able to tell other people the answer, why the Jewish people belong in the land of Israel, why we are not occupying the land of Israel, why this, this land belongs to us. Again, not that people on this uh, Zoom can't uh, answer those questions, but we're going to do it systematically here. Number one, the historical claim to the land of Israel. Number two, the legal claim to the land of Israel. And number three, the Jewish survival claim to the land of Israel. Okay? One at a time. Number one is the historical argument. Um, by the way, as we go through each of these claims, what we're going to do is we're going to try to point out what the weaknesses are with each of these claims. Like that we, we get an understanding, first of all, for why all three of them are necessary. And then when we finally present the Torah's perspective, for what the Torah's claim to the land of Israel is and why Jews even, even consider a homeland necessary, we'll, we'll, we'll see the value in that. Um, so let's start with the historical claim to the land of Israel. Um, text six is <laughs> from a book called Maccabees, um, which you can read about uh, uh, in your sidebar. You guys have that, right? The sidebar is about exactly what this is. But this is from the story of Hanukkah, the times of the story of Hanukkah, the famous Maccabees, and we're all familiar with Judah Maccabee, right? Yehuda HaMaccabee. He had a brother, his name was Shimon, okay? And there was a period um, during the Greek Seleucid Empire's uh, uh, rule over the land of Israel, which is in the second century BCE, that Antiochus, um, well, well, before that, back up, back up a second. There, there was Antiochus' predecessor, who was a man, I have his name here, hold on. His name was Diototus Tryphon and Demetrius II. There was, sorry, sorry, there was a, a, a power struggle between these three. Diadotus, I knew I was going to forget these names, I have them written down here. Diadotus, Tryphon, and Demetrius II. I don't think the details are that that important. Either way, at that time, Shimon, the, the brother of Yehuda, Yehuda the Maccabee, was the ruler the, uh, of the Jewish people, the Kohen Gadol, the high priest. And he was also granted independent rulership over this little province called uh, Judea at the time by, uh, by, by the, the, Greek, the, the, the Greek Seleucid uh, 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 leaders. Now, um, Demetrius II was, was succeeded by Antiochus, Antiochus, the famous Antiochus, who eventually um, um, uh, started the whole, the whole destruction of, of Hanukkah, which led to the Maccabees uh, uprising. Um, and Antiochus, who was also known as Antiochus Epiphanes, in the beginning made a pact with Shimon, but eventually sends him flying. He says, uh, I want you out. He demotes him. And that's how all of the Hanukkah friction starts or at least part of how all the Hanukkah friction starts. But here's what happens. Shimon responds to Antiochus' messenger, and this is where I think there's some very, very profound insight. Um, Joanne, can you read for us, please? Text six, we're on page 10. Simon answered Antiochus' messenger and said to him, it is not a foreign land that we have conquered, Neither is it the possession of others over which we rule. It is the heritage of our ancestors, which was for some time unjustly conquered, which we, up upon obtaining the power to do so, have restored to ourselves. Thank you, John. So Antiochus Epiphanes takes this, this approach where, get out of here, it's not your land anyways, you conquered it from these, you conquered it from those, whatever it is. He says, get out. Um, but Shimon says, no, no, no. This is a land which, even though we may have conquered it recently, actually always belong to us. And this is the, the, the argument that Shimon makes, which is the historical argument, the historical claim that, that, that uh, the Jews have the land of Israel. If you turn to page 11, you'll see figure 1.2, where you see that ever since the conquest of the land by Joshua, 
uh, which is in the year uh, 2000. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm thinking Hebrew years, uh, which is, I guess, in the year about 1200 BCE. Um, ever since then, there had been consistent um, Jewish people living in the land of Israel, no matter when, when it was. There, were, there, may, there may have been times when it was lower or times when it was higher, but no matter, even when, 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 when Israel wasn't under Jewish leadership, there were always Jews who lived there. In fact, this is stated as one of the reasons why Jews uh, have a right to the land of Israel in Israel's Declaration of Independence. Larry, you want to read for us text 7a, which is from the Declaration of Independence? Okay. The land of Israel was a birthplace of the Jewish people. Here, their spiritual, religious, and political identity was shaped. Here, they first attained statehood, created cultural values of national and universal significance, and gave the world the eternal books of books. After being forcibly exiled from their land, the people kept faith with it throughout their dispersion and never ceased to pray and hope for their return to it and for the restoration in it of their political freedoms. In 1897, at the summons of the spiritual father of the Jewish state, Theodore Herzl, the first Zionist Congress convened and proclaimed the right of the Jewish people to national rebirth in its own country. Okay, pretty powerful, pretty powerful argument, historical argument to the uh, historical claim to the land of Israel. Very nice. Uh, I don't think there's any serious historian that would ever uh, doubt this. Um, I'm not talking about pseudo historians who look at things from their perspective, but really all standard historians take this and, 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 and say that this is true. Um, what I'd like to know from you guys is, what do you think would be the weaknesses and the counter arguments to saying that the Jews have a right to the land of Israel because we've always lived here and now we've come back? Larry, you got anything? What's uh, Ask the question again. What are the weaknesses to this argument? Someone who's arguing against the Jewish claim to the land of Israel, what would they say is wrong with this argument if you're only taking a historical side? I don't know. Remember, I, guys, I, we need to do this. If we want to have sound arguments, we want to actually have a proper conversation, we have to recognize what the weaknesses are with this argument. Lon, what you got? Well, there were cultures... Uh, no doubt that lived there prior to the period of uh, Joshua and potentially, you know, we don't have texts that go back. We have texts that go back about 4,000 years with cuneiforms and all that sort of thing. And I believe that there could be an argument made that there were other uh, peoples that lived in the land early on as right. well, which was first. Not only can there be a conversation that could be had certainly because right. the Egyptians were there when the Jews were there as well. Mm -hmm. not, only but, can, not only can there be claims, even if you look in the Jewish sources, like you look in the Torah, you will see that before Joshua, the land was populated by seven nations, the Canaanites, the Amorites, the... the, the even Hebrews. when Abraham, uh, you know, is alive, he was in the, in the midst of a culture that was multicultural. Is my understanding. Absolutely. Absolutely. There were many other nations that lived there. In fact, Abraham didn't even really have a nation at that time. He, he was really just him. You know, get a, a, a little movement, a little monotheistic movement. So that's one weakness we have here, which is anyone can come and say, okay, you're claiming historical rights. So then let's give it back to whoever preceded the Jews. Why are we stopping at the Jews? Why do you go back in history till the Jews? Right. And then even if the Jews were there for 3000 years, but then you go back before that, if it wasn't the Jews, why are we stopping? If, if it's a historical claim, why are you stopping there? You may have a very, very old historical claim, but not since creation. You know, um, that's an existential problem with the argument for sure. But, yeah, very good. Oh, that's, that's a huge weakness with with the whole argument. It's it's a, it's a, that's something wrong with taking that whole perspective. If we, which is which necessitates the other two arguments. Like if you're only going to take a historical perspective, then somebody will tell you, yeah, but there were others there before you. What else? Because, well, also consider prior to their liberation from Egypt. Where were they then? Well, were the, they at first people? Were they? Well, we have to talk about how large the Jewish nation was before them. That's what I was mentioning to Lon earlier is that in the beginning, you're talking only about Abraham and then his family, and eventually it grows and it becomes a nation. You're, ta you're touching on another conversation, which is when did the Jewish nation start? Is it at Sinai, when the, right, right with, with the revelation at Sinai, or is it with Abraham? You know, that sort of thing. Joanne, you wanted to contribute? Well, I think most people, even if they believe that, yes, yes, there were Jews in Israel uh, 2,000 years ago, that really, after the dispersion, no, no Jews lived in Israel. That seems to be a common belief among uh, many people who don't think that the Jews should 
lay any claim to Israel. They don't see that they don't uh, recognize that there were always Jews living in Israel. That's my understanding. When you say after the dispersion, you're saying after the two temples. In other words, the thousand years. That's right. That's right. Over 1,500 years to live there. Right. I know, but that one I would say is more of a, a, an ignorant argument than anything else. Jews have lived consistently right. throughout the time. It's waxed and waned, but there have always been Jews in the land of Israel. And that, that could just be brought as proof. You just have to bring some things as proof, and then you'll be able to back that up. It's not a weakness in the argument per se. It's a weakness in those receiving the arguments, which you'll always have. You, you're always going to need to have a conversation with someone. But how about this? As, as another perspective, by the way, uh, in terms of historical argument to Israel, um, obviously, Israel is doing a lot of work in that regard with, with, with archaeology and finding things from, right, of course, the famous uh, coin of, of, of the time of Bar Kokhba is, is, is an interesting uh, uh, find in that regard. But another one that was just found recently, I just read an article in Haaretz magazine, it just goes to show that when you dig through history, you don't just find the honorable, honorable parts of history, you also find the disgraceful parts of history. They found recently a... a a slab of stone. I think they know what it was. It was it was something and engraved in that piece of stone were the words Baal Peor, which is one of the famous uh, idols that the Jewish people worshipped and which is taught about in in the prophets and in the scripture. We read about how the Jewish people strayed from the, from from Hashem and they were all serving Baal Peor. And when you go to this heavily Jewish populated area from three thousand years ago, you see not only do you, do you find mikvahs and you find uh, menorahs and you find whatever you know you find the things that 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 were showing the Jews actually serving up, you also find the disgraceful part. Uh, so that, I just thought that was uh, comical when I read that article. Um, but I think another powerful weakness that this thing has, and it really ties into what Lon mentioned, it's not just let's go back earlier. So your whole, and I think this is what you meant, Lon, when you said it's an existential problem with it, your whole, your whole uh, claim here is really based on the fact that you conquered it from people. If that's the case, why does that give you the right to take it back? It was conquered from you, and now there's Arabs here, and now there's these people there, or those people there, whatever it is. Why do you get to come and take it back again? And that becomes especially powerful when you recognize that more recently, we don't really work that way anymore. If France were today to, 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 to invade England and decide that it's conquering England, I would hope the whole world would say, no, it doesn't work that way. You can't just invade. We, 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 we've established that we don't, we don't take land from other nations that way anymore. It used to be, the world did work this way, but since the United Nations, even before that, we, we you know, we, we sort of established that that's not the way we want to do things. Um, and if you conquered it, obviously, as Lon mentioned, you conquered it from others. Uh, so that those are the weaknesses in those arguments, which brings us to the second argument, which is the international law argument. Um, when it comes to international law, so this really all starts with Britain, of course, um, the Balfour Declaration, for those who are not familiar, I, 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 th I think it's pretty... Famous, but the Balfour Declaration was penned by a man named Lord Arthur James Balfour. He was the British Foreign Secretary at the time. This is in November on November 2nd, 1917. He pens this letter um, to Baron Rothschild for transmission to the Zionist Federation, in which basically he says that his majesty's government, which means, right, the British government as a whole, views with favor the idea of an establishment of a Jewish state or a Jewish presence or a Jewish something, Jewish mandate in Israel. This eventually leads to the British mandate for Palestine in which, um, what year is that? Here they say July 1922. It eventually more morphs into the British mandate for Palestine, which was not only issued by the Brits, as the name would, would, would say, but actually by the League of Nations, which was the predecessor to the United Nations, um, that's in July of 1922. Um, now, this, this eventually leads to, of course, leads to, to the establishment of the State of Israel um, in 1948 with, all, with, with everything that happened there, but it also leads eventually to the, to, to the Jewish state being accepted, the State of Israel being accepted into the United Nations once it was formed. Um, not just, you know, today the United Nations is famous for having all sorts of anti-Israel sentiment, um, but at the time, actually, it's important to understand that out of 56 member nations of the UN at that time, 33 countries, which is 72%, voted for the plan. It was for the British, for, 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 for the British mandate, which then led to to Israel, etc. And, and and the division, of course, the Arabs rejected it, and that was the war. But besides that, they they accepted the status quo of Israel being there. Um, this again is mentioned. By the way, I should mention that eventually, even till today, right uh, uh, in. 2016, out of a total of 192 UN member states, 161 recognize Israel as a state. 
So if we're looking at the United Nations and, and, and the League of Nations pre, pre, previously to the, previous to that, uh, prior to that, we have a very strong legal argument that the world has, has kind of made a very clear legal uh, uh, decision that Israel belongs to the Jews. Again, this is mentioned in the Israel Decl Declaration of Independence. Um, Lan, can you read for us, please? Text 7B. 7A? 7B. 7B. 13. Right was recognized in the Balfour Declaration on the 2nd November of 1917 and reaffirmed in the mandate of the League of Nations, which in particular gave international sanction to the historic connection between the Jewish people and the land of Israel and to the right of the Jewish people to rebuild its national home. On the 29th November 1947, the United Nations General Assembly passed a resolution calling for the establishment of a Jewish state in the land of Israel. General Assembly required the inhabitants of the land of Israel to take such steps as were necessary on their part for the implementation of that resolution. This recognition by the United Nations of the right of the Jewish people to establish their state is irrevocable. Okay, so weaknesses for this argument, anybody? Adrian, you with us still? Wally, you got any weaknesses to this argument? You guys can't just sit quiet. We need we need your voice. We want to hear you. <laughs> What's wrong with saying that the Jewish people's right to the land of Israel is because the United the world gave it to us, the United Nations, the League of Nations, they gave it to us and they said it's ours. There's nothing hmm. wrong. No, I'm nothing wrong with that. But what are the weaknesses, guys? We got to be weaknesses. Um, here I'm thinking. What do you think? Well, I don't know. It's hard because you know the United Nations has changed its character and mission so much since then. Um, Thank you very it, much. It's, it's exactly what I'm looking for. What if the world changes its mind? <laughs> right. Okay. The world changed its mind. <laughs> so if our claim to the land of Israel is all based on the fact that the, that, that, that the UN said it's ours. So if the UN says, oh, actually, we made a very big mistake. It's not yours. We've examined oh, it. Right. Further. It's not yours. So then does that mean that we just relinquish our claim to the land of Israel? Obviously, no, no. the historical claim would back would back that up. But Heidi, you want to share something? You're muted. Oh, yeah. I just I'm I'm rustling around. I just didn't want to make too much okay. noise. What do you think? Well, not every nation was a member of the UN at the time, and even now, not every nation is a member of the UN. So, for a certain select group to say, you know, we establish this, the whole world isn't going along with it, no matter what. Very good. Okay, so there are many nations, and by the way, you neglected to mention there were also nations in the United Nations that even until today don't recognize Israel, and definitely some that back then didn't recognize Israel. So they can say, look, we're just not part of this. Now, I think the answer to that would probably be, look, you got to get on board. The United Nations has become the international legal, you know, uh, authority. But they, you're right, they might reject that because they're like, we don't talk, don't talk to me about international law. The UN is not a good, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, policymaker when it comes to that. I know many Jews that would say that, right? And mm -hmm. which is why we're saying that, that that's not our be all and end all claim to the land of Israel, but it is powerful to recognize that we have a strong legal claim to the land of Israel. Joanne, you want to share? Uh, I was just going to say what Heidi said that the United Nations in 1947. Um, I don't know how many of the Arab nations were really a part of it at that time. And uh, it's not so much that the United Nations changed their mind, but I'm not sure who the United Nations really even <laughs> represented in 1947. Right. So, you know, but you could look at, well, we're not getting into that, but you could look at other things like the United States and it's dealing with the nations that were here before the Europeans came. Very good. We're and, getting it. Hold on. Hold on. We're getting it. All right. <laughs> I, I don't know how to raise my hand here. So. Okay. Go ahead, Adrian. That's fine. Okay. Um, yeah. You know, it always strikes me as very amazing that, you know, people say, well, Israel was just created. Well, so was Pakistan created out of India. And Jordan also was created well, around the same time. Isn't that correct? I, I think I mean, that's similar to what Joanne was mentioning, that, that the U.S. At, at one point was also just created. Right. right. So, but I mean, even around the same time that Israel was created, Pakistan 
was created. Nobody's complaining about that. The general you know. perspective that all of you are mentioning is hypocrisy, which we'll talk about shortly. Hypocrisy when it comes to dealing with Israel versus dealing with other nations. Uh, Larry, go ahead. I was just going to say that Kuwait was created in 1930 yeah. by Britain. Lots it was of out of it was carved out of Iraq. <laughs> lots of lots of hypocrisy. Okay. So, can Good. I ask one other question? Yes. Go this ahead. Remarkably stupid. Sorry. So if the Balfour hold Declaration. On, hold on. You don't just get to make a statement like that and the rabbi doesn't get to respond. First of all, I don't think that you're remarkably stupid. Certainly not. And even the comments you're going to make are not remarkably stupid because, as many many people who have been to my classes know, in Pirkei Avot and Ethics of Our Fathers, it says, Velo lamid, that someone who's embarrassed never learns. So even the stupidest question is a question because otherwise you wouldn't know it and or otherwise you wouldn't gain that perspective or otherwise, that, and, and there might be many other people that are wondering the same thing. So please okay. ask. So, no question. Here's what I'm stuck on. If the Balfour Declaration was intended to establish a homeland for named Palestine, mm -hmm. was that intended to be for Jews? Yes, it was clear. Okay, that so then why now? What just, happened? The people on. who identify as Palestinians are not Jewish. Hold on a second. Because whoa, whoa, whoa! A few things here. So first of all, just to clarify that that letter. Right? The Balfour Declaration was sent, Lord Balfour was just representing the, the British government. At the time, he sent it actually to a Jew. He sent it to Baron Rothschild, and that was his intention to say that, that the, the purpose is to create a home for, for Jews. What was the follow-up question about Palestine and Palestinians? Well, if that was intended to create a homeland for Jews, mm -hmm. did it not do that? I mean, what happened? What was the result of the Balfour Declaration? Well, if as you mentioned, if you go through history, the Balfour Declaration led to the League of Nations uh, uh, decision in 1922, and then <laughs> the British Palestine, which led to the War of Independence in 1948. That's what it led to eventually, where the Arabs rejected it, right? The Partition Plan and all that sort of thing. But how is it the Palestinians? So, who was, so at that time, at that time, who was identifying as Palestinian or? Nobody. That's you know, between that. between the Balfour, the adoption of the Balfour Declaration and 1948, who was identifying as Pal Palestinian? Like anybody Nobody. who lived there? Nobody. Israel was a very complicated time at that time, a, a very complicated place at that time. I mean, if you go back earlier than that, it's the Ottoman Empire, etc. But it, during that time, there were many Jews living there and there were many Arabs living there. And in fact, this letter is and, and the British mandate and all of that, some of it is a response to the fact that the Jews and the Arabs were clashing in that region over the land of Israel. Which Already is in 1948 and the, and the War of Independence, and our Arabs rejecting the plan, but Jews accepting the plan, etc. Okay, maybe they would have done better by the Balfour Declaration calling it Canaan. Yeah, okay, maybe <laughs> Palestine was a name that the Romans had given it, so at that point it was already in use. So I guess that would predate that would predate though, the Romans. What would yeah, Canaan would, would predate the Romans? My point is, I guess, that the Romans predated the Ottomans and, and, and the British, so therefore. They, I guess they used that word. And that's to ask you a question. Heidi, the answer to your question is that Palestinians is not, it, it's uh, to be honest, and I don't want to get into that whole issue because it will be the topic of future lessons. It's not really, there aren't really a Palestinian people because Palestine isn't really a country. It, it, if you watch the whole evolution of it, there were no people that, there are no, no indigenous Palestinians. Right, okay, thank you. Moving along, the third argument that we have is the Jewish survival argument. Um, and this one I think is pretty straightforward. Um, but again, mentioned in the, in the Declaration of Independence for 2,000 years, the, the, the Jews have been, ever since the destruction of the Second Temple, the Jews, not those that were living in the land of Israel, although even those living in, living in the land of Israel were persecuted, the Jews of the land of Israel were scattered all over the world, and there's lots of people persecuting them, and, and anti-Semitism in every country, and, and, and of every different color, etc. I'm not going to talk too much about anti-Semitism, but I think we are all very much aware of it. There was also the Holocaust, of course, and that kind of exaggerated issues. Please hold with me one second. Camp, uh, the, the campers have returned, and I'm just going to close the door so that we don't hear their background noise. And so the land of, in, in this argument, what we say is, look, the Jews have tried to just gain statehood in, in, or gain uh, citizenship in other states, um, in Spain, in Germany, in Eastern Europe, in Russia, in everywhere. And Jews have even contributed a lot to the, a lot to those societies. No matter what, somehow they've always been rejected in one form or another of the same claim, which is you don't belong here. You guys are not really American. You're not really Canadian. You're not really. I'm, I'm talking about today, right? Where many people say this anti-Semitic tropes, where people say 
would tell me, for instance, I'm not really American, I'm really Jewish, and therefore I should go back to where I came from, right? This, this, this line that gets thrown around all the time, go back to where you came from. And in this, in this argument, it says, okay, if you want the Jew, if, if, if Jews cannot trust any other place, then they have to now have their own states. And in fact, this was one of the strongest driving arguments of, of Zionism at the time, was we need a place to call our own, where anti-Semitism can finally come to an end. Because this will be the place where the Jews are, and there might be anti-Semitism in other places, just like maybe French people are hated in, in Belgium, but they can always go back to France. Jews can be hated in other countries, but if they, if they, if they, uh, if they want to, um, they can always come back to Israel, and over there, that, that's their home, and nobody will hate them for being Jewish. Uh, this line of reasoning, again, is also contained in Israel's Declaration of Independence. Um, Adrian, can you read for us? Do you have the text open? I don't have it. No, I couldn't sure. find it in my email. Larry, you have the text in front of you? The PDF? No, sorry, not Larry, uh, uh, Howard. I don't have the text yet. I don't have it. Okay, so we're going to go back to the same people. Joanne, you're up. <laughs> text 7C. Uh, for those that don't have your book, you're always welcome to pick it up. I have them here outside my office, as mentioned in the email. Joanne, you're, you're muted. There we go. The catastrophe which recently befell the Jewish people, the massacre of millions of Jews in Europe, was another clear demonstration of the urgency of solving the problem of its homelessness by reestablishing in the land of Israel the Jewish state, which would open the gates of the homeland wide to every Jew and confer upon the Jewish people the status of a fully privileged member of the comity, comity of nations. I think it's supposed to be the community, no? Well, no, comedy. Well, Jews are also responsible for a lot of co comedy. <laughs> Anyways, um, it's a pretty powerful argument, but I think the counter arguments to this one are very, very clear. Anybody? Wally, what you got? If I tell a non-Jew, listen, we need Israel because um, otherwise there's no way for us to survive. Every other country has rejected us. We should have a home. What are the counter arguments? You uh, keep giving us the counter. I've spent all my life with the pros, not the cons. <laughs> He's like, I don't like to think of the counter. Can, I like to think. Can of I the can I respond to Heidi for a second, though? Sure. With didn't which chime in. So real quick, um, prior to Israel's independence, Palestinian, you could be either Arab Palestinian or mm -hmm. Jewish Palestinian. And with Israel, uh, the, the Arab Palestinians took title because of the currency of victimhood. And if you'll note now, this is what they do best. They play victim. And um, they've found that that's the way they can survive, and the world just funnels money to them. Um, so Jews don't own that title anymore. But if you go back to the uh, Balfour uh, time, they definitely, if you were Palestinian, you could be either Arab or Jew. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, hold on, just, just to give like kind of the full history here, from 1517 to, to 1917, right? Remember, 1917 is, is, is the Balfour Declaration. From 1517 to 1917, the land of Israel was part of the Ottoman Empire. Mm -hmm. um, and in 1917, which is after the defeat of the Ottoman Empire in World War I, the Ottoman Empire was dissolved, as happened very often throughout history when different empires, either empires were taken over by other empires, or they were eventually dissolved and became smaller nations. Um, so there was, a, there was kind of a series of international treaties that were signed determining the status of different, you know, huge swaths of territories that it had ruled in the Middle East and so Southeastern Europe, all over. Um, the mandate for Palestine, which was what the, the League of Nations called, right, that the British mandate for Palestine, um, Palestine was entrusted by the League of Nations to Great Britain. And the purpose of that, that entrustment was to create, to create a homeland for the Jewish people. So what people would have been called before that, like while, he, while he's mentioning Arab Palestinians or Jewish Palestinians, that's, you're talking about a very brief period there, Wally. You're talking about from 1970. Yes. Before yes. that, I can't yeah. call themselves Ottoman. Yeah, that's Ottoman what Turks. I was asking about. Right. I think before that, they're calling themselves Ottoman Turks or anything like that. Right, 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 right. Probably still referred to as Palestine, but it was kind of a, a, a small part of the large Ottoman Empire. Remember, that's 400 years there, five, uh, 400 years. Anyways, but back to where we are here, the Jewish survival argument. Um, Howard, I think you want, you wanted to contribute something? Well, I, I, I think uh, one of the answers could be that uh, uh, there are other persecuted peoples uh, that uh, one comes to mind would be gypsies. Uh, and, you know, that they have a right to claim a home for themselves. 
too. What what happens to these other groups of uh, persecuted people? Okay, that's a very. Yeah, I, I also have a comment on that. That is um, a very, which is why should right? Why should um, uh, why should Israel? Why, why should Jews be the only one who only ones who are given a home state? Maybe that should. Be well, yeah, but it might also be that you know. They could say, well, do it in Uganda. That's where. Very good. Saying, That's another very why good. do it here? Do it in Uganda. In fact, there was even a proposal to have the, have the state of Israel. While you're mentioning Uganda, another good answer to the Jewish survivors. Okay, we get it. The Jews do survive. But listen, Israel is a very uh, hotly debated area. We're giving you Uganda, which Uganda has actually agreed to give right. you because we need this little space right. for the Jews to survive. By the way, on that note, the world could also choose to say, it might not be, we might say it might not be in very good moral conscience. But the world can say, you guys need to survive. This has nothing to do with us. Why should the French or the British or the or the Americans care that the Jews need to survive? That's your problem. So you guys find yourself a space. I don't know. Go to the middle of the Amazon uh, rainforest and, and grab yourself a swath of territory and make it mm -hmm. yours. Don't start now with, with Israel and making Israel. So why why Israel? Why our responsibility? And I'll add one more, much, probably a much more fundamental argument, argument which is, is that even a solution? Is the land of Israel even a solution to Jewish survival, right? It's presented as if it's an answer to Jewish survival. But let me ask you a question. Um, say tomorrow we find out that Iran does have a nuclear bomb. Are the Jews safer because uh, 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 7 million of us are, are in Israel? Or would we be safer no. out among all the nations of the world? Right? No. Safer and diverse. Everybody knows when it comes to your, to your funds, right? To your, to your, you always diversify your investment in your portfolio, right? Um, Maybe when it comes to the Jews also, the Jews should be all around the world because like, they're safer that way. Why is it safer to have all the Jews in the same place? I get it. We have a good military. We have a, we have a good defense system. But just to remind you that we're talking here very often from the perspective of 1967. Imagine if in 1967, like in the 20 years from 1947 to 1967, um, the Jews had actually been extremely successful. The Zionists had been extremely successful. And every single Jew around the world had landed in Israel. Can you imagine? And now there's this 1967 war and every single Arab nation is threatening the existence of the, of, of the land of Israel. Is there one you know, that we, we say often say to Jewish survival? I don't think we would say that's the key to Jewish survival, right? Without yeah. knowing obviously what happened in the victory of the Six Day War. Yes, Adrian. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you on that because I, you know, I plan to go to Israel, God willing to make Aliyah, but um, I also think it's important for Jews to be all over the world to, and to affect governments and to, you know, to help keep us safe in the diaspora, you know, even to keep Israel safe by being in, you know, Chutzla Aretz. Mm -hmm. It's a very, very good point. Now, I think these three arguments, oh, hold on. So let's just summarize some of the counter arguments that were brought up and some of them are not here because we brought them up. Um, number one, why the land of Israel? Why can't it be Uganda or anywhere else? Number two, greater concentration might actually equal greater danger. And a third point is why should the world be the one to give it to us? Just because you're in danger doesn't mean that the world owes you a country. Okay, um, another point that I will mention is that these three arguments together form such a st strong basis for the Jewish claim to the land of Israel, even though each one has its weaknesses, that there isn't a single country in the world that can claim all three of them. And to be quite honest, I don't know that there's a single country in the world that can claim even one of them. Um, name me another nation that can show its roots living where they live going back 3,800 years. Certainly not the U.S., certainly not Canada, right? Not, not, none of us here, we're all brand new, four, 500 years, right? What about if you go across okay, the Chinese, 3,800 years, the Indians, right? I, I don't know there's another nation in the world that's been in the same, that's indigenous to their area, because as we mentioned, though, that's the way, that was the way of the world, conquest was the way of the world for many, many years. Uh, how many other nations can say that they were established by a broad consensus of other nations saying we're creating a law that this land belongs to this people? America certainly can't say that. The, the UN never voted on whether the, the US belongs to the Americans, right? There, was, there, there never was a, a, an international legal discussion. And the mm. same thing, I don't think there's a single American that would say my safety is dependent on America being in existence. Me, I'm just a person. Right now I'm an American. Of course, I would, I would try to defend America, et cetera. But let's say America was conquered by somebody else. My safety doesn't depend on that. I'm just another citizen and I would end up under someone else, right? And I would then become from American to whatever new uh, country conquered me. I think it's only the land of Israel that can actually claim these three things so powerfully. Um, and yet, here, here we come to the hypocrisy, there isn't a single, uh, a, a single nation that's being told, give back your land to someone else. America isn't being told, give California back to Mexico, right? 
<laughs> anybody, anybody concerned that uh, maybe tomorrow you won't have a home because the U.S. will say everybody's got to be, uh, you, you, everybody's got to be evicted. You can all go find homes in Montana because uh, we got to give California back to Mexico. I don't think anybody's worried about that. Not only that, nobody in the world is saying that, or that the Australians should give over whatever that the, the entire Australia should be given over to the Aborigines, or that the Russian, right? Remember the Russian takeover of Crimea? It made news for all of a month, <laughs> and then we moved on. You know, the argument, there's an argument to be said about all the things you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. Those entities that have taken over other lands like America from the Native Americans were the strong men that had new, greater armies and stronger strength from a military standpoint, which is true in most all places. They're the winners. So, and yes, there, there has been a takeover of, and people were told to get out of their own land like America, as an example. Right. Only one example. There are many of them. There are many examples. So what, what's your, and, and Israel is the same way. And yet they are not being told that, right? Um, uh, is, meaning the US is not being told, give it back to the Native Americans or give it back to Mexico or, give it back, or, or, or whatever. So what I'm saying is there are people that are saying give it back, but they don't have the strength in the society. Oh, oh, oh that's You're saying the claim exists often. Yes. I know, sure. but- I, Same I, with the Maoris and same with the Aborigines. Right. I guess we're talking about serious claims. There, there isn't a, 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 a serious to the people that are on the losing side. No, of course, of course. What I mean, serious is like from an, from, an, from an objective perspective, you look at it, Israel, it's a very strong claim. And, and you know what? Here, I'll add something else in. I don't think there's another nation besides for, in other words, maybe the Native Americans are telling the Americans we would like our country back, or the Aborigines are telling the Australians we would like our country back, but there are no other countries telling Australia it's time for you to give it back. That's true. And, that, and, and that's, I guess, a very, very strong point, which is ironic because America doesn't have as much of a right to the U.S. as the Jews have to Israel. They don't even have any of those three. Not a historical claim, not a legal claim, and not, and not a survival claim. Unless you consider British tea being taxed via survival claim. <laughs> I, I, I don't know that that's uh, strong enough. Um, does anybody have any, anything that would answer this phenomenon, why it is that there's this hypocrisy when it comes to Israel in this regard? Because we're obviously missing something, right? Anybody? Uh, Joanne, go ahead. Oh, you'll do it soon. Adrian, go ahead. No, I, I, I'm thinking, I know it's just a, there okay. is this double standard in the world. It's definitely a double standard. So that, that's and the question of why, um, you know, that gets us into all kinds of philosophical discussions. Well, that's the discussion we're here to have. And actually, I, I want to mention that Juan mentioned something earlier, which could be an answer to the question, which is PR. Maybe one of the reasons is because Israel is so bad at PR and America is much better at PR. You know, I don't know. I, I don't think that's the case. I mean, okay. if, if anything, I would say that, you know, the Palestinians or the Arabs and the leftists, et cetera, they're the ones who dominate our PR in all areas. You know, not just Israel having to do with Israel, but in the way we think and so on. They're the dominant, you know, they're attempting to be the dominant force in any event. Um, I'm not sure exactly why, you know, there is, I, I think it gets us back to anti Semitism probably as a, a, at the root of it, especially, you know, the Arab uh, yeah, antipathy I, towards the Jews. The Jews are not the only hated minority in the world. <laughs> there are other hated minorities. That, that maybe, I mean, I can't think of a specific example. There are other hated minorities out there and the whole world doesn't choose to show double standards to them and start hating on them. Yeah, I, I don't know why that is. Yeah. Okay, That's the I, question. I, have, I have a suggestion, which we're gonna come up at the end of the lesson. We're going a little over time today, uh, maybe because of all the introductions and because of all the, all the, uh, the inputs. Um, Joanne, go ahead. Well, I think it is a PR thing. And I think that the Arab countries just have really better PR, you know, I live here in Altadena where we have a significant Armenian population. Yes. And not too long ago, there was a military action in an area that's part of, I don't even know, uh, Azerbaijan or something where Armenians have lived in this area for like a couple thousand years, 2000 years, and yet it's legally the part of Azerbaijan. And, um, it did not, there wasn't a single article about that war in the Pasadena Star News where we have this huge Armenian population. I couldn't drive down the street without seeing all these flags saying, you know, 
uh, whatever the name of that area is, is part of Armenia, and, and it was all over if you lived in this area. But it didn't, there was some national news on it, a little article here, and then another article when it was over explaining why the U.S. kept their mouth shut during this whole thing, and about the the political allies between Russia and Turkey and blah, blah, blah. And so I think some of it really has to do with the the power of the Arab nations. Um, it's not just PR. They have a lot of power in the world, especially where the oil is concerned. And, you know, you know Israel's been phenomenal in terms of their technological things with what they've given to the world, but I don't know, people don't, it's not seen the same way as oil is, you know, when, when Saudi Arabia wants to cut off the oil, we're really, you know, going to be stuck. So nobody's going to stand up against these countries well, that because it's going to harm us economically. Right. That might, that might be an interesting reason. Um, I will add to that, by the way, that if, if we're going down that route, that you're going to say, oh, it's all, uh, I don't know, politics, but it's all kind of like uh, one hand washes the other, and there's different things going on in different nations. And this nation needs that nation, that nation needs, needs this nation. In that regard, by the way, we could say that that's one of the answers for more recently um, the Abraham Accords. And I don't know if any of you have thought about this, but the Abraham Accords, which was started by Donald Trump and his his crew, but obviously it's still going on. Has, did anybody notice a very interesting thing that a couple months after the Abraham Accords were announced? Um, there was tension in Israel, Hamas firing rockets, and the whole world saying Israel is the aggressor and Israel is destroying the Palestinians. It's so terrible, so terrible, so terrible. And yet, not a single country, I think we're three in total, right? Um, Qatar, Sudan, and, and, and the UAE, not a single one of them backed out of the Abraham Accords. Um, in fact, there was a TV interview that was done um, with uh, one of the sheiks, I think from, from, from Dubai, United Arab Emirates. Who, who came on together with a Jewish um, Supreme Court justice from Michigan, who's actually coming here to talk. Um, he's coming to Pasadena in January of, of uh, 2022. He's coming here to talk. He's gonna be here for Shabbat of Torah and he's, he's gonna be our guest speaker here. I just confirmed with him on Friday. Um, and he was, he's, the one, he's the one who was telling me this. He said, the reason why none of them backed out is because he, he's blind. This, this judge is blind. So he's done a lot of advocacy work on behalf of those with disabilities, et cetera. And he said that one of the strong driving forces behind the Abraham Accords is that the, the Arab nations, which are led, of course, by these royal families and these sheiks, and et cetera, many of them actually have children or grandchildren or cousins or uncles, whatever it is, with disabilities. And they're looking to gain for their country what Israel has done for Israel. If you, if those of you that have been to Israel, you know that Israel has done phenomenally well with making sure that it is inclusive of those with disabilities, but be it those that can't walk properly, those that, that don't see, uh, blind, deaf, et cetera. Um, Israel's done phenomenally well that way. So there's technology to be had, there's experience to be had, there's prowess to be had, and, and they're looking to gain that from Israel um, in exchange. So that's kind of one thing behind there. So that would tie in directly to what you were saying, Joanne, that if there's something to be gained, then that kind of leads to relations uh, 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 becoming better, et cetera. Interesting. I, I would like to present in the remaining minutes, which I have none of uh, for this class, um, but I am going to ask you for 10 more minutes. What I'd like to do is present the Torah perspective. I'd like to start with an interesting Rashi, the first Rashi in the Torah. So the Torah opens up with the words, Bereshit para lo kimit ha-shamayim et aretz. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? And then there's the first Rashi in the Torah. Rashi is the foremost commentator, uh, for, for foremost commentary on the Torah. And the first Rashi asks a simple question. Why did the Torah start with Bereshit? Heidi, can you read for us, please? Text eight. Not ready. Okay. <laughs> Page 15. Got it, got it, got it. Okay. Uh, Rabbi Yitchak said the Torah ought, am I reading the right thing? You are. Yeah, okay. The Torah ought to have begun with the verse, this month shall be to you, etc. Exodus 12, 2. The first, first mitzvah commanded to the people of Israel. Why then does it begin with, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth? The strength of his works, he related to his people to give them the inheritance of the nations. Psalms 111, 6. If the nations of the world will say to Israel, you are thieves for having conquered the lands of the seven nations, Israel will reply, the entire world is God's. He created it and granted it to whomever he desired. It was his will to give it to the seven nations and it was his will to take it from them and give it to us. And this my friends is the, the Torah claim, the Torah's claim, the Torah preserve. The fourth argument, which I think 
is really the root cause of it all, and will give us a lot of explanations for everything as we go through it, for why Israel belongs to the Jewish people. Rabbi Yitzchak is asking a very simple question, and Rashi is quoting him. He says, the Torah is a book of laws. You know, instruction. In fact, the very word Torah means instruction, right? It's, it doesn't mean, it's not a historical book. So why does the Torah start with history? And he has a very critical suggestion. He says, why don't you start with the words, this month shall be for you, shall be for you, which is the first mitzvah mentioned in the Torah, which is the mitzvah of sanctifying the new moon every month, etc. Rosh Chodesh. Why does it start with, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth? And he explains that the reason for that is that God is preempting a claim, a potential claim. Remember, this is before CNN. This is before the, the New York Times. This is before the BBC. God is, 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 is circumventing the fact that someone may claim that the Jews don't have a right to the land of Israel. And therefore, when God created the world, he's, he, and he puts it in the Torah, he says, in the beginning, God is the one who created the heavens and the earth. So who is the true owner of the entire world is God. And God gave the, the, the land of Israel to the Jewish people, so therefore it belongs to the Jewish people. Where do we find that? So the Torah is really full of it, but I'll give you five specific examples. The first time that we find God promising the land of Israel to the Jewish people is when God speaks to Abraham and he's in, the third, in the third part of the Torah, and he tells him, Lech Arzucha, go from your land to the land that I will show you. And then he says, this is the land that I will give to you and to your children. Um, the second time is in the 15th chapter of the book of Bereshit. Uh, God has this interesting covenant the covenant between the parts, it's called the Brit Bein Abisarim, um, where God, quote unquote, represented by a pillar of fire, and Abraham walked between the, the pieces of meat uh, uh, or pieces of flesh of an animal that had been divided in half. This was common at those times. That this is how you kind of uh, cemented a bond. It was kind of like, just like these two pieces, just like these two pieces of flesh were part of one animal, so too are me and you. We will always be together. So God did this in the way of the land at that time. And during that covenant between the parts, we read clearly, uh, Hashem says that uh, that uh, your people will be strangers in the land of Egypt, but then they will come back to this land, and this will be the land that I will give them, the river of Egypt, until the great river, the Euphrates, etc. Avraham, of course, has two sons, Yitzchak and Yaakov, Isaac and Esau. I'm sorry, Yitzchak and Esau, uh, I, uh, Isaac and Esau, and Hashem again stresses, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm a little tired here, bear with me. Yaakov. Yaakov. And, no, no, no. Avraham has two children, Abraham has two children, Yitzchak and Yishmael, Isaac and Ishmael, and God again emphasized it to Yitzchak that I will give the land to you, right? In other words, emphasizing that which line from Abraham does it happen? The same thing happens in the next generation. Um, after Yitzchak has two children, Jacob and Esau, Yaakov and Esau, um, Hashem gives the land to Jacob and his descendants. And then again, when Moshe is at the burning bush, again, Hashem says, I'm going to take the people out of the land of Egypt. I'm going to bring the land of Israel and I will give them that land. Seen in this light, isn't it interesting that if you look at the first 13 parshas, which means from the beginning of the Torah until, uh, uh, and there's a few commentary that point this out, by the way, uh, um, uh, from the beginning of the Torah until the first mitzvah is directly focused, kind of agenda driven on presenting the real claim that the Jewish people have to the land of Israel. Not historical, not legal, and not survival, but that Hashem gave the land to the Jewish people. Um, and in fact, even as you go throughout the rest of the Torah, we find something very interesting. The land of Israel keeps coming up again and again. Remember, they don't enter the land of Israel until after the five books of Moses are completed, right? But as throughout the five books of Moses, Hashem has given the Jewish people the mitzvot, every single mitzvah is incomplete until we arrive in the land of Israel. Text nine. Larry, if I can ask you to read for us, please. Sure. I was here, I'm reading ahead in 10, so here I am. Sages of the Talmud uh, declared Anyone who lives outside of the land is comparable to one who has no God, as is written, to give to you the land of Canaan, to be God for you, in Leviticus 25, 38. For all the mitzvot of the Torah were given primarily to be fulfilled by those who dwell in the land of God. If you start to go through the mitzvot um, um, in the Torah, many of them can only be fulfilled in the land of Israel, or their ideal fulfillment is in the land of Israel. So maybe you could do it outside, outside of the land of Israel, but ideally it should be done in the land of Israel. And so we see this strong, strong emphasis throughout the Torah that, that um, uh, 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 the Jewish people have to connect to the land of Israel and that the land of Israel has been promised to the Jewish people. Um, the Rebbe would often point out that we as Jews often make a very silly mistake. 
when people ask us why do the Jews belong in the land of Israel, we start to get get involved in all sorts of arguments, historical reasons and legal reasons. Not that any of these things are not true; they are all true. But that's not the root cause of the issue, and that's why each one of them has the weaknesses and wh why people can come and say, "Oh, uh, the land of Israel doesn't doesn't actually belong to you." But if we would stick, says the Rebbe, to the real reason why the land of Israel belongs to the Jewish people, which is because God gave the land of Israel to the Jewish people, and lest you think that people wouldn't accept this, we'll talk about that in just a moment. Um, says the Rebbe, it would be much, much, it's much more honest, it's much more truthful, it's, it's academically more transparent, and it, it's also, it, it would also be more readily accepted. Let's tackle one more issue, and with this we'll conclude and we'll wrap it all up. Why is it that the Jewish people are so obsessed with the land of Israel? It's nice that we see it all over the Torah, but why? Why is it so important? Judaism is, 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 is a uh, a, a religion of ideas. You know that when, when Zionism was starting, um, Albert Einstein delivered a, a, an address at the Commodore Hotel in New York. This is 1938. There was the, one of the organizations was the National Labor Committee for Palestine, right? Which later later included um, uh, later this this speech was included in in in, in our debt in Zion our debt to Zionism, um, which is a book which is a chapter in a book of, called, called Out of My Later Years. By Albert Einstein. Um, and Albert Einstein presents this, this perspective. He says, I don't get it. He says, in the beginning, Albert Einstein was very uh, not anti Zionist, but he, he presented that it might be dangerous to become so Zionist. He says, because, you know, to be so Zionist is to, is to, is to turn Judaism into a nationality. He said, what do, what, do, what do Jews have to do with the land? He says, look, I'm no religious Jew, but Judaism is all about spiritual ideas. It's about moral ideas, ethical ideas, a light into the nation, it's about making the world a better place. What does it have anything to do with a land? What does it have to do with a physical land and a nationality? Right? Um, <laughs> what business do we have building a country, an army, an economy? Like, 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 since when is this something that we ever have to do? Like, why should we be busy with physicality when we're all about spirituality? So the problem with this is that it actually is a misrepresentation of Judaism. And herein lies the key, and, and this has been a claim by many people, but we'll read it as it is beautifully here by Rabbi Jonathan Sachs. Um, in text 10. Um, where are we holding here? I guess Lan, if you will. Um, I have a comment about the land, but I'll get to that after reading okay. this when Go I ahead. get to that time. Why should a religion be tied to a land? It sounds absurd, especially in the context of monotheism. Surely the God of everywhere can be served anywhere. Judaism is not primarily about personal salvation, the relationship between the individual and God in the inner recesses of the soul. It's about collective redemption. We are social animals, therefore we find God in society. That is what we discover when we reflect on the basic structure of the Torah's and many commands. They include laws about the administration of justice, the conduct of war, ownership of land, employer-employee relationships, the welfare of the poor, and the periodic cancellation of debts. Laws shape a society, and a society needs space. A sacred society needs sacred space, a holy land. Hence, the Jews in Judaism need their own land. In 4,000 years, for much of which Jews lived in exile, the people of the covenant were scattered over the face of the earth. There's no land in which Jews have never lived, yet in all these centuries, there was only one land where they were able to do what almost every other nation takes for granted, create their own society in accordance with their own beliefs. Keep going. Hold on. Three more lines. Another page? I think so. The premise yeah. is the premise of the Torah is that God must be found somewhere in particular if, he's, if he is to be found everywhere in general. Thank you very much. And this is a very, very important point. If you haven't been listening to the whole class, I think this is probably one of the strongest takeaways we can take. If we put Jonathan Sachs against Albert Einstein, which is not really what we're doing, because Albert Einstein was only one person voicing that, that argument, which is that Judaism does, doesn't need a land, and Jonathan Sachs is only one person summarizing thousands of years of commentary, which are talking about why Judaism has the land of Israel as holy. But if we were to put the two of them against them, what Jonathan, what, what Jonathan Sachs is saying to Albert Einstein is, listen, dude, there is a fundamental misunderstanding that you are having about Judaism. Judaism is not a religion which we are supposed to escape to. It's not about having a certain spiritual oasis that, look, we live in the material world, it's a terrible place, and as often as possible, we should escape that spiritual oasis in which we connect with God and we meditate and we spend, no, no, no. The whole purpose and creation of the world was that we should come into this world and change and make the world a better place. And in order to really emphasize that, there has to be a space 
which is going to be ruled by Jews, run by Jews, uh, 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 affected by Jews, and Jews will live and actually be able to show that way of living in reality. If you look through the Torah, the Torah is not full of a whole bunch of meditative ideas. There are other religions that are like that. Wherever you go, you take this religion with you, it stays in your head, in your heart, and it's a spiritual idea and a spiritual entity. That's not what Judaism is supposed to be. Judaism is supposed to be a way of life. Now we can do that anywhere because Judaism is part and parcel of the way you're supposed to live in this world. In fact, when God creates the world, it says, and we say this in Kiddush every single week, Lasos Lesakim, Asherban Lekin Lasos. It says when God created the world, he created the world to make. And everybody asks, what does that mean? He created the world to make. And the commentary explained that he created the world imperfect in order that we should be able to make it perfect. God created the world in such a way that we should be able to come into the world and make the world a better place and live, it, live in there as a just and upright society, etc. Talk about the Jews being, being the light unto the nation. All of that becomes most emphasized when you recognize that there's supposed to be one place in the world which is kind of an example for how society is supposed to live. And for many years, the Jews did that in that land. Then there were, then, then, and then there were times when the Jews were kicked, kicked out of that land and persecuted in that land, etc. But that is essentially the model in which Jews are supposed to actually be in the world, physically connected to soil, and actually turning that land into a land where the Torah is shown to be true. Um, and that, this also explains a very interesting phenomenon. Anybody ever take a look at a map? You notice that Israel actually stands at the crossroads of civilization. Where most of civilization has lived for, for much of the world, for, for much, much of history, Israel actually, you couldn't really go from one area to another area without passing through Israel. This is an argument that's made by Arya Kaplan in text 11, um, which, uh, Heidi, can I ask you to read, please? Page 18. Uh, uh, oh, sorry, actually it's Joanne's one. I'm, I'm getting mixed up. I have only four people and I'm getting mixed up. <laughs> Joanne, text 11, please, page 18. If you look at a map, you will see that the geographical location of the land of Israel um, virtually guaranteed that it would play a key role in the tides of civilization. The old world consisted of two great land masses, Eurasia, Europe and Asia, and Africa. It was impossible to travel from Eurasia to Africa without passing through the Holy Land. Therefore, every conqueror, every civilization that passed from one continent to the other had to pass through the Holy Land and come in contact with the Jew. Besides being a gateway between North and South, the Holy Land is part of the keystone link between East and West. In the past, most caravan routes linking the Atlantic and Pacific passed directly through the Holy Land. The land of Israel was therefore literally the crossroads of civilization. Thank you. Uh, and I want to conclude with one final point and then open up for questions because I'm already very over time. <laughs> Quite over time here. Um, there's two more texts to read. Um, and and, and they, these two texts, I'm just going to let the text speak for themselves, but they really emphasize one very, very important point. Earlier, we asked the question of why Israel is treated differently than the rest of the world. And I think the answer is not bad PR, not anti Semitism. Not any of the, although they're all contributing factors, the real reason why Israel is treated different, why Jews are treated different than the rest of the world is because we are different. And that's something that's important to, to, to appreciate. Um, we have a religion which, which, which tells us that God is not just the God of the heavens, but God is also the God of the earth. Um, and, and, and this, believe it or not, Less and this, believe it or not, is the root of a lot of the reason why people cannot stand the idea of Israel standing as a society. Um, Ruth Gavison uh, is an Israeli legal scholar who has dealt a lot with why, you know, uh, I guess you could kind of say working on the PR with the rest of the world and working on arguing Israel's case for existence, et cetera. Let's hear what she had to say. I was going to call on Heidi, but I guess, um, Larry, if you can, please, uh, text 12. Yes. Uh Text 12. Okay. Mm -hmm. it is, it is, is it possible to justify the existence of a Jewish state? This question raised with increased frequency in recent years is not just a theoretical one. Israel will endure as a Jewish state only if it can be defended in both the physical and the moral sense. Over the many years in which I have participated in debates about Israel's constitutional foundation and the rights of its citizens, I did not generally find that, feel this question be particularly urgent. Indeed, I believed that there was no more need to demonstrate the legitimacy of a Jewish state than there was any other reason, any other nation state, 
They did not make claims to the contrary very seriously. Those who denied the legitimacy of Israel as a Jewish state were, in my eyes, little different from the radical ideologues who dismiss all national movements as inherently immoral or who insist that Judaism is only solely a religion with no right to national self-expression. Their claims seem marginal, unworthy, and systematic refutation. Today, I realize that my view was wrong. The repudiation of uh, Israel's right to exist as a repudiation of Israel's right to exist as a Jewish state is now a commonly held position and one that is increasingly seen as legitimate among Israeli Arabs. For example, it is nearly impossible to find anyone willing to endorse, at least publicly, the right of Jews to national self-determination in the land of Israel. Rejection of the Jewish state has, in fact, become the norm among most representatives of the Arab public, including those who were, have sworn allegiance as members of Knesset. More worrisome, perhaps, is the fact that many Jews in Israel agree with this view, or at least show a measure of sympathy for it. Thank you, Larry. You know, the historical argument, the national legal argument, and the, and the Jewish survival argument, are all very valid arguments for why the land of Israel should belong to the Jewish people, but it's actually not enough. Um, for the Jewish people, it's not enough. Um, for the Jewish people, we really have to begin to learn and to appreciate the fact that, that our real right to the land of Israel begins in the Torah. It begins because we believe in God, we believe that God gave us the land, and God gave us the land so that we should be a light of the nation to, to, to show the world what it means to be uh, 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 you know, a, a just and an upheld society, etc. Which is why, by the way, Jews should not be afraid to criticize the state of Israel. The state of Israel, with its legal, doesn't always make the right decisions. And there are times when necessarily we should criticize the state of Israel because it's doing things that are not morally upheld and are, that are not morally just, etc. And we're going to tackle some of those issues as we go through. But to the best of our ability, we should be living in a land and we should, we should recognize the reason we're living in that land is because God gave us this land so that we should live here in order to represent to the entire world what a true and just society looks like. Um, and we'll conclude with text 13 by Rabbi Jonathan Sachs about why it's so important for us to know what our true claim to the land of Israel is. Um, Lon, please. Sure. Uh, today, the overwhelming majority of those who challenge Israel's right to exist believe in Israel's God. That is to say, the God of Abraham. They belong to the large family of faith known as the Abrahamic monotheisms. To them, we must humbly say, when it comes to political conflict, let us search for a political solution. Let us work together in pursuit of peace. But when it comes to religion, let us not forget that without Judaism, there would be no Christianity and no Islam. Unlike Christianity and Islam, Judaism never sought to convert the world and never created an empire. All it sought was one tiny land, promised to the children of Israel by the creator of the universe, whom Jews, Christians, and Muslims all believe. Sadly, Rabbi Isaac was right, and Rashi was right to quote him at the beginning of his Torah commentary. The Jewish people would be challenged on its right to the land by people who claim to worship the same God. That same God summons us today to the dignity of the human person, the sanctity of human life, and the imperative of peace. And that same God tells us that in a world of 82 Christian nations and 56 Muslim ones, there is room for one small Jewish state. Thank you. Um, I don't want to take up too much more time. My apologies, my sincerest apologies for going so over time. I don't usually do that. I'm usually much better about timing the lesson. I think we had a lot of input this time, so maybe that's part of it, which, which I like, but we have to figure out how to balance those two. Um, but I want to conclude by saying one thing. What Rabbi Sachs is saying here is, and then we'll go to the lesson summary. What Rabbi Sachs is saying here is that we have to recognize the true reason why we have a right to land of Israel. That doesn't depend on any body of nations or on the fact that that's the only place that we could survive because none of those things are necessarily 100% the reason why, why we belong in the land of Israel. The reason why we belong in the land of Israel is the reason why what, that Rashi told us, that Rav Yitzchak told us, and that the Torah has been telling us for, for, for millennia, which is because Hashem gave us the land. We should live there. And we should not try to conquer other lands. We should not try to create empires. We should just live in that land and be true to the Torah and the mitzvahs and follow the way of Hashem. Be moral and upstanding people and a light of the nations as to, which, as, as to how we affect the world. And if we can, can appreciate that, then when we will tell that to anyone else, they will, if we actually believe that, we actually mean that, we actually appreciate that, and we embody that, then that will, be, that will be accepted by everyone else. And it's not such a big deal for it to be accepted by someone else. It's the same God... The, the, God and the same religion that gave them so many other amazing things. Um, 
and we'll take uh, two minutes now to watch a video which will summarize the lesson. And then uh, I'll let you guys go after uh, 20 minutes over time. My apologies. Lesson one, people of the land. One, although God is everywhere, Israel is the physical location that serves as the epicenter of the Jewish people's relationship with God. Two, Israel has been the homeland of the Jewish people for more than 3,000 years. In every generation, even when the land was under foreign rule, there were Jews living there. 3. Despite suffering millennia of exile and dispersion, the land of Israel has always remained foremost in our nation's consciousness and the object of our love and yearning. We recall Israel at every Jewish event and every life milestone. 4. Throughout the centuries, we have longed for the day when we would return to the Holy Land. Every time we pray, we face Jerusalem and beseech God to return us to our ancestral homeland. Over the centuries, many Jews have made Aliyah. Many more who could not have chosen to be buried in Israel's soil. 5. The establishment of the State of Israel in 1948 provided the opportunity for many Jews to realize the dream of living in the land of Israel. Though the State of Israel stands on firm legal foundation under international law, Israel's Arab neighbors refused to recognize the legitimacy of the nascent Jewish state. 6. In May 1967, Egypt expelled the UN peacekeeper stationed in the Sinai Peninsula and announced a blockade of Israel's access to the Red Sea via the Straits of Tehran. Arab armies massed, and the Arab world openly pronounced their intention to push the Jews into the sea. Israel was on the precipice of unspeakable tragedy. 7. Despite the Jews' well-founded claim to the land of Israel, a claim that is certainly at least as valid as any other nation's right to their land, Israel's legitimacy is still being questioned by wide segments of the world community. 8. Our ultimate claim to the land lies in the scriptures, whose entire narrative reads as the Jewish people's title deed to the Holy Land. God made a covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and entrusted them and their descendants with a special mission. The covenant and the mission are inexorably bound up with the promise of the land. 9. Our purpose in life is to sanctify the physical world. To that end, God assigned a specific land to us and tasked us to create there a very mundane but divinely perfect society. Our example radiates and ultimately transforms the entire world. 10. In order to be able to tell the world why the land of Israel is ours, we first need to know ourselves why we need a land and what our truest claim to the land is. Next week, despite the fact that war was practically inevitable, Israel faced immense pressure not to launch a preemptive strike. Israel ignored these warnings and struck first. Next week, we will explore the ethics of preemptive strikes. In hindsight, was Israel justified in its decision to initiate active hostilities? And how do these deliberations apply to the host of moral threats that Israel faces today? Please join us next week, um, either at 1 p on, on Monday, either at 1 p.m. or at 7.30 p.m. in person, 1, 1 p.m. here on Zoom or 7.30 p.m. in person for lesson two, Lightning Strike, the Ethics of Preemptive Strikes. Thank you all for joining us.